Ho, ho, ho. Chase ghosts come with sleep. sleep. Watch out. Demons are coming. Run. Sleep. Hide. Spirits. Run. Ghosts. Ghosts. Hide. Demons. Ho, ho. Ghosts. Demons are coming. Good evening, my little hellhounds. Sorry for not uploading in a while. I have been really ill and lost my voice completely. But your master of the hellhounds is back and ready for all your creepy stories. Tonight we have six scary stories to sink our hellish teeth into. If you have a scary story, post it to my subreddit reddit.com forward slash r forward slash home of scares to have it read on the channel and follow me on twitter at home of scares please remember to subscribe and like the video as this really really does help and click that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now, let's get right into it. Saved by the property manager. Posted by Hei Lin. Let me preface this by saying I am not the most observant human in the world. I am usually in my own little world and busy planning the rest of my day before I have a chance to enjoy the moment I am currently in. I am actively working on this because I am aware it makes me an easy target. Not to mention it makes enjoying life to its fullest impossible. Anywho, I don't live in the best part of town, certainly not the worst, but we have our share of shootings, stabbings and drug related issues. That said, I feel pretty safe in my apartment complex as we are in a little nook off a main road and all of us neighbours know and watch out for each other. To be honest, we are a pretty good little community. A couple of weeks ago, I came home from work and as I pulled into a parking space, a woman who I had never seen approached my car. I'm pretty caught off guard. I don't like people approaching me. Hell, I don't particularly like people and talking to people. She started saying she needed a ride. She needed to go to a storage unit just down the road. At this point, my mind is racing, trying to even think of a storage unit nearby. I'm kind of doing the thing my poor deaf grandmom does, where she smiles and nods while this girl is talking about needed to take her stuff to her storage unit and she is pregnant but I have no clue who the hell she is I just got home and I have to take my dog out and I have things I need to do that is literally all that is going through my head because I had my afternoon planned out and now this lady is talking at me and I'm getting stressed because I have a hard time telling people no because I'm terrified of disappointing people. Next thing I know a loud deep voice snaps me from my mini internal freakout. You doing alright Haley? Thank God our property manager had been watching and saw that I was looking uncomfortable. He informed her that she and her friends, who I had not even noticed, were hiding between buildings near the main entrance, needed to leave immediately. So I wonder what would have happened had I let this girl 
in my car, would it have been a totally normal good deed? Or would I have gotten carjacked and ended up getting myself killed? I don't know, but the fact that I didn't pay attention in my own backyard and noticed that there was a group of five people that didn't belong, just blending in, gives me the willies. So, moral of the story, I need to pay better attention and get worked up over the right things. I was friends with a ghost girl posted by OK Package 6963 I recently came back to the Let's Read channel after not watching for a while and it reminded me of something weird that happened when I was younger so I was around 12 and just started to go to secondary school here in the UK. My school was far away from where I lived so I would get a coach each morning to do the hour drive up to my school. It would normally take me 30 minutes or so to walk to the stop where they would pick up me and the others waiting. One morning the girl I usually walked with was ill so I was doing the walk alone I had my headphones in, as I always would, and was around halfway through my walk when I felt a presence around me. I wasn't cold, but all the heat I had held disappeared in a second. Now, my family are very spiritual, and being an edgy 12-year-old, I always like to believe in the paranormal. So with this old aura surrounding me, I finished the walk to my coach and got on when it arrived. Normally when I was on the coach, I'd sit with the girl I would walk with, but I had sat alone at the front of the coach that day. After about 10 minutes of driving, I felt a presence in the seat next to me. I couldn't see anyone there but I could see an image of her in my head. She was a little girl, probably around six or seven, with light blonde hair and big blue eyes. I'd never seen or met her before, but she made me feel safe and I didn't feel as lonely with her there. We didn't speak the first time, just rode the one hour journey in silence. Then when I got off the coach and went into the school building, the aura was gone. I didn't tell anyone about it because I didn't want my friends thinking I was weird. But it stayed with me all day. These meetings started to happen more often, mostly when I was alone. She would sit with me in the house when I was alone and I started being able to know more about her. She never said anything, but I just started to know more and more. Her name was Vivian. She had been very poorly when she was alive. She was in a wheelchair, which made sense because she only ever appeared in a sitting position. I'd spoken to my grandma about her and she said she must be my guardian angel, which at the time made me really grateful. Around four months after Vivian turned up, I went to visit my nana. She didn't live too far, so I made the walk up there to visit for the afternoon. It had been a while since we had seen each other, so she started to ask me about school, my family, and then she asked me if I had any new friends. I told her that I had met some people at my new school, but then I mentioned to her about the little spirit 
that speaks to me sometimes. She tilted her head and started asking me about her. I told her the only things I really knew. She was a little girl, pale with blonde hair and blue eyes. She was in a wheelchair and she only ever showed herself when I was alone. My nana leant back in her chair with wide eyes, but her expression soon softened. I asked what was wrong. She said that she had never told me this before, but she had lived in the house next door to mine when she was younger. And on top of that, in my house, there was a little girl who lived there, named Vivian, who hardly ever came out because she was sick all the time. My nana recounted that a few years before she moved, Vivian had died after getting pneumonia. Her mother and brother moved away not long after. I sat there and just stared at my nana. My brain was failing to process what she had just said, but I just nodded and had a sip of my drink, unable to think of something to say. Then my nana said something that still warms me to this day. She probably shows up when you're lonely because she didn't have anyone to talk to when she was alone. I'm sure she sees you as her friend. After the visit, I never saw Vivian again. Sometimes I'd purposely stay at home alone to see if she would show up, but she never did. I'm 20 now and it's all so strange when I think back to it. I was a pretty lonely kid, so the fact a lonely spirit tethered itself to me so I could have a friend still makes me smile to this day. The Hollering Devotee at the Temple of the War Goddess Posted by Bloody Spaghetti Anyone who knows me, I have military stories for days. I served for three years, didn't serve in the States, so my stories aren't flashy. I didn't go around shooting people halfway across the world in the name of democracy. I'd say compared to the American soldier's service, mine was tame. If you consider encountering people who want to turn you into a shish kebab before they chuck you out of a window day in, day out, tame. Speaking of the shish kebab thing happened to some poor reservist 20 years ago. I had to deal with those people every single day. Granted, nothing happened to me because I was taught how to defuse an escalating situation that could be diffused. Here we value the lives of humans, even those who hate us for no reason beyond indoctrination drilled into them. This story is different. This story is a little more mundane and far more bizarre than someone just getting shot or blown to pieces. I'm sure people have this idea in their heads. War is hell because so many people die. That's a misconception. War is worse than hell because innocent people get dragged into it. War is worse than hell because people learn to stop seeing other people in front of them. They see mobile targets. It becomes a situation of kill or be killed and it weighs down on everyone involved. As long as we're not talking about psychopaths, no one wins in wars. Everyone loses. 
some lose less, some lose more. If you ask a person with military related PTSD what broke them, chances are they'll tell you it wasn't a single event. Granted, there are cases of people who've seen something so fucking awful. This one single event is enough to torture them 40 or 50 years later. But these are probably the rarer cases. Like this one, former military medic who saw his brigadier get blown up. The guy some 40 years later still remembers the sight of the exposed spine and gore of his commanding officers who told him to remove the rocks from under his back. These weren't rocks, these were the bandages that the medic placed on his commander's exposed insides. The poor man still hates walking on sand because it reminds him of these haunting last words of his commander. What breaks people is going from zero to 300 miles an hour in a matter of 0.5 seconds. The stress kills. The stress of military life leads people into depression and suicide too. Even without the hazing and whatnot, here especially now, it's fairly harmless. Younger soldiers won't get the best beds, will have the dirtier duties and will be called military jargon names which are meant to symbolise their lack of experience. Beatings and violence aren't so much a thing anymore. The stress drives people insane. The lack of sleep, the physical strain, the need to jump from duty to duty due to manpower shortages, the strict regimen, the shitty food, the awful living conditions, all of that leads to a build up of stress that can and will lead young men and women towards the abyss. Anyway, a few months before my discharge, I was stationed at a military camp called Anatot, aptly named after a war goddess. The naming was unintentional. In eastern Jerusalem, due to the length of my tenure, I was used as a reserve soldier in my unit, meaning I didn't have to do shit until someone was out of commission for whatever reason. I spent a few weekends being part of the security of the camp, being the only combatant on this unit. I was placed in the most volatile section of the camp, a watchtower overlooking the nearby village. As much as the local soldiers played it up as this potentially combustible section of the camp, it was beyond quiet. It was quite frankly boring in other words. I was getting to the rest on duty. The shifts were relatively short just four hours on duty, then eight hours of rest, and four additional hours of duty time from Thursday afternoon until Sunday morning. Simple, easy, refreshing. The officer in charge of camp security would pop up every now and again to check on me. That's about it. I'd spend my hours there doing nothing but kicking my feet up on a stool and keeping an eye on the nothing unfolding ahead of me. One weekend I went sick on duty, feeling a bit under the weather I got my hands on paracetamol and did my thing. The night shift rolled by and I was driven to my watchtower, which is quite the distance from the barracks. I spent the night doing the usual nothing until at 
about 1am, I saw someone walking around on the road ahead. Now, someone walking on this road usually wasn't strange. It was a rather sparsely used road, so the populace frequently walked on it. What was strange is that this person was walking around in the dead of night. Nobody seemed to walk there during the nights. The road was mostly empty during the night time. You'd get a few cars to pass by, but that's about it. I looked at the person for a few seconds before noticing that they were walking kind of strangely, pacing only almost stumbling, swaying side to side. What I noticed to be even stranger is that this person was walking in a sort of circle, back and forth, almost like they were unsure of what to do. That's what we'd call a suspicious behaviour. So I kept my eyes locked on that strange person, who at first seemed drunk to me. I've already had encounters with drunk people going where they shouldn't, such a case wouldn't have been surprising. My throat had itched so I reached down to my bottle and gulped down some water. I took my eyes away from this person for about a second as I drank. Once I returned my gaze back to him, he was sporting a rifle. My brain went from zero to three hundred immediately. The first thing I did was load my gun. At that moment, me missing a very obvious rifle at first didn't even seem like a strange detail. I didn't even think about how odd it was that a rifle suddenly appeared slung over this person's shoulder. As I switched off the safety and readied myself for this bastard to try to charge the fence. Contacting command over the radio, I made sure to keep my eyes on them. After some back and forth with the guys in the war room, I was told to start the suspect arrest protocol. That is what we do here when we're trying to arrest someone whom we might suspect as a dangerous individual to civilians or military personnel. You shout at your target to stop. Warn it you will shoot a few times before actually shooting. If they become a clear and immediate danger to you or anyone else, you're free to shoot them to incapacitate. Shoot the legs. If they become a danger to someone's life, in that same moment, you're free to shoot at the center of the bodily mass. If they stop, you don't shoot them. You just arrest them using only the necessary force in reaction to their own behavior. I went over the protocol and this person just ignored me. I couldn't shoot them either because they had a rifle. It was just slung over their shoulder the figure wasn't even looking at me, it was just stumbling around aimlessly. For that reason I couldn't shoot it. We value life here, unlike other places. Now that's a thing people don't talk about, not everyone has the guns to commit a murder or become a guerrilla martyr. Maybe people get cold feet once they're faced with the armed forces. The person below just stopped at one point and stood there for a few moments. These few moments seemed to last longer than they actually were. Then the person started walking off to the south, making sure I kept my eyes locked on this person. I notified command that they were going to the south and I'm keeping a watch over him as they move. I kept myself glued to the silhouette until it disappeared in the darkness of the night. Ten minutes later, an officer arrived in a hammer. 
and questioned me. I told him about the ordeal in detail and he asked me to stay alert before returning to his hammer and driving off. The radio went nuts with everyone trying to spot this mysterious figure. The lookout saw someone moving along the perimeter of the camp. Forces were called into patrol and if possible apprehend the armed individual. I listened to the radio attentively as the situation kept unfolding. I started hearing a strange humming at around 1.30 o'clock. I assumed it was coming from the radio as our equipment was old and clearly had many issues. The noise kept getting louder and louder until it became irritating. I smacked the radio out of frustration and a hoarse, almost voiceless, pained scream echoed from beneath me. It came from beneath the watchtower. It was long and shrill, almost like nails digging across a board. My body tensed up and my reason shut down. The brain went on autopilot. There was no questions to ask. Someone was crossing every line they could and I was going to put a stop to that. I violently opened the door of the watchtower. The scream from below died down. I positioned my rifle in clear view of whoever might have been below me, just in case. Nothing happened. I yelled out, but there was no response. The adrenaline kept on leading the way. I stomped my way down the stairs, leading to the top of the tower and looked around, scanning the area as carefully as I could. I was alone. My mind must have been playing tricks on me. My illness and the stress of the previous hour must have been taking their toll. Once I realised I was alone, I started calming down. The flow of adrenaline stopped and I was starting to feel the usual aches and pains that had been bothering me for the past few months. My head was starting to spin a little. Looking at my watch, I was glad my shift was about to end in a few minutes. I didn't plan on telling anyone about the incident for two reasons. People would think I'm insane and because I breached protocol and left the tower unattended. I climbed back up to the tower and slumped against the door, clutching my rifle. My head was turning really light. I was almost flying. Chills rocked me. I was spacing out badly. A loud, hoarse, shrill scream blasted straight through me. I felt myself shudder violently in place as my heartbeat rocketed once more. The scream was unbearably close, painfully so. My head instinctively turned towards the source of the scream. The tower shook for a second and I felt a blunt, pulsating pain originating at the back of my head. My stomach turned and I felt myself going out. Another scream echoed through my form as I realised what was the source of these awful vocalisations. A pallid man dressed in a military uniform was trying to claw his way into the tower through the window. His eyes pure white, yellow teeth with shades of caramel brown. Blood covered his face and uniform blood coming from a massive opening at the top of his head. Bits of his brain were leaking from his skull. That's the last thing I remember before waking up in the infirmary a couple of hours later. Apparently I was burning with a high fever. The guy replacing me found me passed out 
lying in the middle of the tower, sweating bullets through my uniform. I had the flu and spent the following few days rolling around in bed, not leaving the barracks. I didn't bother telling anyone about the ghastly, wailing soldier, assuming it was just a fever, hallucination or dream. The rifle-carrying individual wasn't found either. The assumption was that they had been gripped with fear at the last moment and just left because the lookouts had spotted something too. The key word was something. It was a movement they couldn't really make out. Not that it mattered. I almost forgot about my feverish experience until one guy I was serving with told a local military legend of sorts. Everyone considers this a legend because nobody has the precise details about the events. Just a bullshit story that servicemen tell newcomers about a soldier who had decided to off himself in the same watchtower I was stationed at. Apparently said soldier decided shooting himself was going to be too loud and he didn't want that kind of attention so he opted to off himself by throwing himself through the tower's window. The hair on the back of my head stood when I heard the ending of this legend. Apparently the suicidal soldier's head hit the legs of the tower before crashing down on the rocks below. This resulted in his skull being cracked open like a watermelon. Someone else chimed in and said his face was contorted into a pained grimace. The guy telling the tale corrected his friend and said they actually found the soldier's body with his mouth twisted into a scream. How I exposed the vile underbelly of TikTok. Posted by MTP6921. I became infatuated with a blonde girl on TikTok named Chloe. So much so that I would watch her live streaming content on a daily basis for the past month. She did nothing more but hold her phone in her hand while laying in her bed and respond to mostly men's instant messages. I always thought it was kind of pathetic that the girl was very attractive and was way out of my league and she would actually respond to my messages when she was streaming live. Sometimes there would be 150 people watching her live streaming, then other days there would be only eight people viewing who were mostly guys. Tonight is a slow night for her when she only had eight viewers but then again it's 2am where most people are sleeping. As 2.15am approached she hit an all time low of having only four viewers which I didn't mind because then I would be the focal point of her attention. I always thought that she was alone in her room when she was streaming live. However, I just heard something deeply disturbing that wasn't meant to be heard by her viewers. I heard a male voice whisper, Do something. Where Chloe's face looked really fearful After hearing the male voice and she said, come on guys, come back, what can I do to make you guys not leave? What do you mean? I messaged her. Oh, I just want everyone to have fun and keep watching me, she typed. 
She couldn't get her viewers up this early in the morning, so she said good night everyone. Then her live streaming was disconnected. I was a little bummed out that Chloe ended her live session, so I browsed TikTok to see if any other girls were streaming live. Then I came across another attractive blonde whose name is Levy. So I joined her live session. She too had a low view account because it was so late at night. I typed in, hi Levy, how are you doing tonight? I'm fine, I'm just hanging out. That's cool, how old are you? I'm 20 years old, Levy res responded. Then I heard a faint male voice say, show some more of your chest. Where Levy's face went from relaxed to looking very uncomfortable fairly quick. The male voice seemed eerily similar to the voice on Chloe's live session. Levy pulled down on her dress without exposing too much which drew in more people who were casually scrolling through TikTok and within a minute later her view account went up significantly to the point where she couldn't answer everyone's questions. Levy looked uncomfortable, exposing most of her chest. As I started to look at Levy's bedroom where she was filming her live session from, I noticed that when she pointed her phone's camera to the ceiling that it was the same ceiling fan and unusual octanal ceiling shape as Chloe's room. I thought to myself that what are the chances that someone has the same exact ceiling fan and the same highly unusual ceiling layout. So I continued to watch Levy's live sessions to pick up on other characteristics of her room. Then I said, what the hell, out loud when I saw Levy had the same dresser and her closet was in the same place as Chloe's. This is the same room as Chloe's, I said out loud. Being that I'm 31 years old and older than most of the other male viewers on TikTok, I'm probably the only person who cares enough to pick up on the room similarities to the point where it's undeniably the same bedroom. I always thought these young women were just doing these live sessions out of fun while hoping to make some extra money. However, this is the first time that I thought something really sinister was going on. I thought to myself, why would Chloe leave her bedroom? so another young woman could pretend that's her bedroom to start another live streaming session. There was no other logical explanation other than these girls were working in shifts and were more than likely being forced to do these live sessions. Something else that irked me was when a male viewer would jokingly type into Chloe's live session, I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you where Chloe would respond to those offensive comments with send me a private message which I previously had thought was just a joke but now I'm assuming that these girls are unwillingly prostituting themselves out so I typed in I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you into Levy's live session like clockwork, she responded back, send me a private message. So I sent the private message and Levy responded, where do you live? I live in Pennsylvania. Oh, I'll be in Maryland in two weeks from now, Levy messaged back. That's not horribly far from Pennsylvania. Can I see you if I drive to Maryland? I responded, sure, if the price is right, lol. Levy responded, how about $200? Um, I think I'll be too busy when I visit Maryland to see you. How about $500? I think I can find time to see you, lol. 
Okay, how do I send the money to you then? Send the $500 to this PayPal account that I'll copy and paste in a second and then I'll send you the address and time when you can see me. Once again I thought this conduct was really unusual and I doubted that the person who I sent the private message to was actually Levy but it was more than likely that guy who I heard in the background. I thought to myself $500 is a good amount of money but it's also a figure that most young men could come up with. That most obvious thing to do was wait until Chloe came on her live session tomorrow and ask her the same question of can I come and see you? I woke up the next day and went to work then I came home and waited for Chloe to come on. I logged on to TikTok with one of my dummy accounts and eventually she logged on to her live session. I waited a few minutes then I typed in I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you. Where Chloe typed in the same phrase as Levy did, send me a private message. I went through the same back and forth messaging where I almost couldn't believe it when Chloe messaged me that she will be in Maryland in two weeks and I had to pay her $500 to get an address and a time. I now had the disgusting feeling that these young women were somehow being trafficked. So I paid the $500 to both Chloe's and Levy's PayPal account and unsurprisingly, I was given the same comfort in hotel address in Glen Burnie, Maryland, but with different hotel rooms and different times. I now was on a mission to uncover how many young women were being exploited on TikTok so I continually sent the I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you message on different TikTok dummy accounts that I had created. Amazingly, five other girls said they were going to be in Maryland in two weeks. I didn't feel it was necessary to spend the $500 to get the actual address and time. So I waited the two weeks, then I drove to Maryland and waited in the hotel parking lot where I could see both of the hotel rooms that Chloe and Levy had given me. I was about five hours early from seeing Levy, which was the first room and time that I was given to see. As I waited in the parking lot, I saw something extremely appalling where a bunch of younger guys would drive into the parking lot and get out of their cars and then knock on predetermined hotel doors about once an hour to include Chloe's and Livy's hotel room where the hotel door would open and the young guys would go in. Seeing the car after car pull into the hotel parking lot then seeing some guy get out of his car and head to the predetermined hotel room kind of reminded me of the same visuals of watching countless people get out of their cars to go into a blockbuster back in the day or watching guys get out of their cars to go into a strip club because of the sheer endless volume of guys that would continually enter and exit the parking lot I figured there must be at least 30 different hotel rooms and this hotel was purposely selected because of its large parking lot and the ability for someone to watch from the parking lot at the various rooms that were being utilised by the TikTok girls. I noticed that there were three cars in the parking lot where each car had a guy that was constantly watching the traffic coming in and out of the hotel rooms. These guys definitely looked like shady characters and weren't cops. Eventually my time came to go to Levy's room. So I got out of my car where I felt a sense of nervous enthusiasm to see what was actually going on. I knocked on Livy's door and she answered the door right away. 
I could tell that she was really high on some type of substance which might have been from crack or ecstasy. Livy definitely didn't have the same personality that she displayed on TikTok. She actually handed me a condom within five minutes where I almost threw up from the vileness that was occurring. Livy was so out of it that I couldn't even hold a conversation with her and I could tell that she was brainwashed not to ask for help or anything along those lines. I saw enough of what I needed to see and I gave the condom back to her. Then I went back to my car. I felt a complete sense of disgust and sleaziness come over me where I couldn't even get out of my car two hours later to see Chloe during my assigned time. I decided to just hang out in the parking lot overnight and see what would happen in the morning. The next morning about 8am a large commercial Mart's passenger bus pulled into the driveway which woke me up from my dead sleep. At about 8.15am each TikTok girl was being pushed out of her hotel room by some unknown guy who went from room to room. At about 9am I saw about 50 girls get onto the bus which nearly made me throw up. Then the bus pulled away and I decided to follow the bus. The bus eventually got onto the interstate I-80 west and it just kept driving and driving where I almost fell asleep behind the wheel. I tried to stay far away back from this bus so the driver wouldn't know that I was following it and I had to get gas at some point which I used the same caution and fueled up away from the bus. After almost 20 hours of painstaking driving the bus got off I-80 and stopped in this hole in the wall town in Wyoming called Rock Springs. The bus drove outside of the town and into this large compound that reminded me of the David Koresh compound that the authorities tried to overtake in Waco, Texas. I didn't pull into the compound for fear of my own life so I just took down the coordinates and then went back to the town of Rock Springs where I pulled into a gas station. Because of the magnitude that was going on in that compound I decided that I couldn't trust the local authorities and instead I contacted the US Department of Homeland Security. Agent Sipkowitz took down the information that I had provided and she seemed equally as shocked as I was regarding the magnitude of the operation. Agent Sipkowitz told me that she would contact me if any additional information was needed from me. The next day Chloe and Levy's didn't log on to their TikTok live accounts so I typed Rock Springs into Google's recent news stories and I saw a story about an overnight raid that had occurred where I saw the photo of the compound in Rock Springs and the title read a potential human trafficking operation was uncovered. To my creepy next door neighbour, posted by Juicy Pickle 152. Hey, I'm a new member to this Reddit thing, and I decided to tell a story about my creepy neighbour that harassed me. So, let's get into it. So this all took place five days ago, on a Tuesday. I'm 16 and very paranoid about my safety. But after this, I don't think I can go outside by myself ever again. 
without some type of protection. After online school, I took a shower and decided to go outside with my two-year-old nephew. So I put on my clothes and shoes, grabbed my nephew's hand and walked out the door. I live on the bottom floor and so as three more people, but one of them just had to be my creepy neighbor. He's tall African-American, skinny with a beard, looks like to be in his late thirties. While walking to the front of my apartment, I didn't see his truck anywhere. So I had a sigh of relief. Few minutes passed of playing and chasing after my nephew, a white Chevrolet pickup pulls into the complex and stopped a yard in front of us and just watched us. I didn't see him drive past us because I was making sure my nephew wasn't running places he wasn't supposed to be and I was also on FaceTime with one of my best friends just in case. But when I looked up and to my horror I see him staring back at me just watching my body was paralysed in fear. After snapping back to reality, I grabbed my nephew and started to speed walk back to my apartment. In fear, I slowly looked back to see if he was still watching me, and just as I thought he was. But this time, he put his truck in reverse and started backing up, really slow, still watching me. That's when I held my nephew as tight as I possibly could and ran as fast to my apartment. Before I got up to my door, I heard tires screeching like he sped away, but I didn't care to look. I ran in my apartment, locking my door behind me out of breath. I told my mom everything. When I told her what just happened, her face went from concerned to pissed off. That's when she told me not to go outside by myself from now on. I just wondered what could have happened to me if I was outside by myself. I know this story wasn't very long, but I just wanted to get my story out there and just remember that harassment can happen to anyone at any age. So please be safe, and if not already, please invest in pepper spray, taser, or any self-defense weapon. You never know what people are capable of. Pantless intruder tries going to bed in my apartment. Posted by Optimistic Olivia 18. Last Sunday, I was at my boyfriend's apartment for the weekend. BF left to go to work about 8 a.m., but not before touching my butt and giving me a kiss on the head. This woke me up but by the time I could open my eyes, he was already out the door. He forgot to lock the apartment door on his way out, to which I had not realized. I got up, put my contacts in, brushed my teeth and put my workout clothes on, starting my day off right with some squats and crunches. Then I make some coffee and toast, hop on the computer to look up hotels and restaurants BF and I could go to on our little in-state vacation. The entry door leads directly to the open kitchen and living room area, which is where his PC is. I hear the door handle turning and get excited, thinking BF is coming home for an early lunch, 10 a.m. The door quickly opens and an older man, 60s or 70s, steps in. My first thought is maybe 
he's the electrician that landlord said would be stopping by but how odd he didn't even knock or oh he's not wearing any pants luckily he was wearing underwear this guy speed walked into the apartment with such a glossed over look I was mostly polite in the beginning saying sir who are you what are you doing here this isn't your apartment I progressively began shouting and cussing him out but nothing would face him he went straight to the dining table and over to a large cardboard box BF had full of board games he sat on them he sat on the games looked like he was going to take a dump on them but then he tried laying down on the games I got up and ran to the bathroom scared for my safety as I'm only 5 foot 2 and not as strong as I like to think I am this guy was about 6 foot and on god knows what I dialed 911 informed the operator everything that had happened as I'm shaking she asked if I'd be able to safely leave the bathroom to let the police in I said oh no need it's unlocked as that's how the guy got in and gave a little laugh she laughed too I heard the cops at the door but they were talking to each other I opened the bathroom door and peeked into the living room no guy I was nervous about checking the bedroom because I'd have to go around a corner and wouldn't be able to see very well suddenly I hear sir where are your pants from the hallway I'm standing right at the door to listen and text in BF everything that's just happened they had the guy in cuffs and the druggie kept shouting they were hurting his hands the officers asked him where he lives and what he's doing here the guy said where he lives seven streets away and he's trying to go to bed not here druggie BF came home shortly after and comforted me we went downstairs to see if the police needed my statement before they took the guy off they said nah we already got it from three other people we found out he went into every unlocked apartment he could an officer walked by with gallon ziplock bag full of pills and pill bottles we found his pants and shoes in the hallway lock your doors folks And that's it for tonight, my little hellhounds. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and click that bell so you know every time I upload. And follow me on Twitter at Home of Scares. And submit your stories to Reddit r slash Home of Scares. Good night my little hellhounds.